Hi, I'm Mrs. Sloan, and this is for my AP Biology students. This is a continuation. This is video two on speciation and macro evolution. So um, this, if you look in the unit guides from the College Board, this is unit seven, and this is topic 7.10, speciation. And if you look at your expectations, I encourage you to pause and read through these because this is what you want that what they expect you to know. If you want a little help with that, I make unit annotated unit guides with reviews in them, and this is a link to it. Um, and we have already discussed um, in video one what a species is and the biological definition of the species and the problems with that, and then all of the reproductive isolating mechanisms. So we're going to start here on number three, the modes of speciation. So let me just scroll down in there and let me present. All right, so modes of speciation and in your notes um, and down in the descriptor of this video, I have the notes. Column one is the scaffolding. I'll help you fill it in. Column two is empty. I encourage you to throw pictures into that. So we are starting at 17.2. The first thing we need, to, we need to know is what is speciation? So speciation is the splitting of one species into two or more or it's the transformation of one into another. So formation of new species. Now, how you go about doing that, the most common way is what's called allopatric speciation. And this is where you have a single species and there's a barrier and you're either going left or you're going right. And so when you look at, remember when we talked about evolution as a change in allele frequencies, and we said one of the things that could affect that is a small population because it's more susceptible to genetic drift, right? So now you're taking your one larger species and you're splitting it. It may not be even like it is here in this picture. It may be a small fraction. And so the allele frequencies in these divided may not represent the whole. So you could have some form of genetic drift. You could have different mutations on either side of this barrier and different selection pressures. Pressures. There could be different environments on either side of this barrier. So you start to accrue, accrue small differences, which over time could lead to enough change that even if you are reunited, you have already achieved reproductive isolation, and so you have two species. So this starts with some sort of a barrier. So underneath um, allopatric speciation, um, it's species separated by a geographical barrier, and then I put genetic drift in there, who then undergo different selection pressures. So some examples of this would be the salamanders as they move from Northern California to Southern California, there's a big desert right in the middle of it. And so they separate it. And then it's called a ring species because you can see a whole ring of new species around the desert here. Here's another picture here where you can see that represented. Um, and there are other examples as well, but that's a classic one. And remember that if when they rejoined, if they would still interbreed, um, and become some, when they became sympatric, if they had gene flow between them, then speciation does not occur. But if they stay two separate species, then that would be allopatric speciation. Now, here's a, a really good example of showing you how the different finch populations could have come about. So here you have your ancestral finch. And on this island, you can see there's like a, a wet earth side to this to the top of this island. You can see a palm tree. And then down here, it looks dry and some sort of cactus. Well, some of the offspring of this ancestral finch flew to a neighboring island. And when you look at that neighboring island, it's very, very dry, just cactus. And there, you're undergoing different selection pressures because the food is probably not going to be the same in this dry environment, right? So notice the beak maybe gets bigger or thicker um, in order to eat the food that is available there. So you're starting to um, have different adaptations per this particular environment. If some of these descendants fly back, you can see the beaks do look different. It's going to settle here in the dry area of this island, and they are not, if they do not interbreed, then this is a, a classic example of allopatric speciation. What was the barrier? This water was the barrier initially. Right, but they had different initial different initial allele frequencies, um, 
different mutations, different selection pressures, which then led to reproductive isolation. Now, how is that reinforced? Through success of staying separate, right? Maybe less competition, but there could be behaviors or even coloration um, that reinforce and maintain that reproductive isolation. Now, what color your dewlap is, your flap, depends on what your environment like, if it's dark or light. And so, um, in order to be successful, you have to maintain that difference. So um, reinforcement of reproductive isolation, the process of natural selection that reinforces, um, think differences in colors and different behaviors that will maintain that reproductive isolation. Now, um, the next um, type of speciation I want to talk to you about is sympatric speciation. So this speciation is you are right next to me and you changed. Whereas allopatric speciation, there was a barrier, right? Something separated us and we kind of went our own ways. This, you are right next to me. So this can happen a couple of different ways, but it's usually a small subset um, of a population. It could be that there are slight differences in our environment. Here's our original environment, we're all the same, right? And there, there is not a geographical barrier, but some sort of ecological barrier, some little difference in diet or microhabitat that's changed. Maybe now our environment's changed and now there's trees. So maybe you like to live under the shade of the tree and I like the open sunshine. It's a preference we might have. And maybe our diet's slightly different. And then we, uh, be, we start to accrue some genetic um, differences or divergence. And over time, then it lands us in reproductive isolation. Okay, so that would be one way. So we were side by side, but there were subtle differences in our habitat we were exploiting. Another way would be for a chromosomal change to occur, and that would um, explain real rapid change. So for instance, on Lord Howe Island in Australia, there are are um, two species of palm tree that are endemic, which means you can't find them anywhere else but here. And you can tell that they evolved sympatrically. They weren't separated by a geographical barrier. They were stuck together on this island. So let's look at some of the ways that can happen. There's two main types and they both involve polyploidy. Remember, polyploidy is when you have an extra set of chromosomes. This is more typical amongst plants, not animals. We don't even do well with one extra chromosome or one less chromosome, let alone a full set of chromosomes. But plants seem to do all right with that. So autopoly auto polyploidy, that is when you have an extra set or extra couple of sets of chromosomes, but you're originating from a single species, from one species having extra chromosomes, and that's what changes it. Allopolyploidy is two different species that have hybridized and then an extra set of chromosomes to make them have homologous pairs and not to not be sterile. So allopolyploidy arise via hybridization from two species. So allopolyploidy, maybe look at those two L's in that, allopolyploidy, two different species, autopolyploidy, a single species. And let me show you how that would work. In autopolyploidy, you have this diploid organism who has six chromosomes. So three homologous pairs, right? Um, so if it were to undergo meiosis, it should make gametes that have three chromosomes because the homologous pairs should separate, right? But here it has not. It has diploid gametes. And if it self-fertilizes, now all of a sudden you have 2N plus 2N. So now we are 4N. We are tetraploid. And like I said, plants might be able to work that way. Animals do not. So on your sympatric speciation, um, let me back up. I owe you number one on that. Speciation without a geographical barrier usually involves divergen in, divergence in diet or microhabitat. Okay. And I'll talk to you about cichlid fishes in just a little bit. Um, some live on the edge, some want to live in the open water. So because some wanted to be, I'm telling you about it now, some on the edge prefer the edge and some open water, they start just breeding within those micro habitats and eventually you have reproductive isolating mechanisms that keep them separate. Or as I'm showing you here, or chromosomes, or chromosomes. Polyploidy is more than 2N and it is more likely in plants. For autopolyploidy, which I'm showing you now, 
2N plant produces 2N gametes due to, and do you remember what it's called? Failure to separate. It is non-disjunction. And um, things today like strawberries, strawberries are 8N, so they do just fine. All right, now let's look at allopolyploidy. Allopolyploidy, you have allo, two different species um, that are related though. You have a wild wheat species one, and its diploid number is 28. So its haploid um, gamete should be 14. Here's a second wild wheat species whose diploid number is 14, its haploid number is seven. So now you have a gamete with 14 chromosomes and a gamete with seven chromosomes forming a zygote. Now that would normally form a sterile hybrid. Now remember, um, we had pre and post um, um, zygotic isolating mechanisms. This would be a post zygotic isolating mechanism. It's sterile, you do not form a new species, except, in plants, if it doubles, if the chromosome doubles forming homologous pairs, then you can form a viable species that can undergo meiosis and form those gametes. So today's wheat bread, it's that this is a hybridization followed by a doubling to make a 2N number then of 42. So let me show you another example of that in flowers. So here's this flower, the Clarkia concina. Um, 2N number 14, gamete 7. This is the Clarkia virgata, 2N number 10, gametes 5. So you would have 5 and 7, right? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 chromosomes. It would be sterile, right? But if you get a doubling of those chromosomes, now you have the Clarkia pulchella. Um, and so now you have a diploid number of 24. So allopolyploidy is two different but related species hybridize than a doubling of chromosomes, than a doubling of chromosomes. Now, let's analyze what we can about this. What do you think happened in both of these? And be specific, okay? My students are probably gonna do an ed puzzle and they will have to predict for me. So here we have one set of trees, one stand of trees, and then look, there's a barrier that runs through it. So we have geographic isolation, right? So what's that going to be? Allopatric speciation, right? Allopatric speciation. And so when that river separated them, then maybe there was a mutation on this side of the river, a little bit different color, fewer different selection pressures. So even if you transplanted one of these trees back across the river, it would not um, breed with these. Okay, so that would be an example um, of allopatric speciation. Now let's look over here. So this one, Okay, it is a single stand, and then all of a sudden we have a new stand of trees that's in here. So we're going to assume that this is sympatric speciation because there is no barrier. But now take it a step further. Remember there was the two types, okay, autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy. So which one do you think this one is? Okay, I would go, I would go with autopolyploidy, and this is why. I only see one species here. I don't see two different species hybridizing in allopolyploidy and then doubling. I just see one species and then a new species emerging out of that. Um, so I think this is a result of autopolyploidy. That's what, that's what I would guess. Okay, so we got everything there. So now let's talk about adaptive radiation. So on your notes, go to um, the define. Let's get the terms in there first. And, and this is true. It's a rapid development of many species, but I want you on your notes defined as a single ancestral species, and it gives rise to a variety of new species. Think of Darwin's finches or the honey creepers. This one is even more. It has 20 plus species from a single ancestral species. Species here, you can see a bunch of dead honey creepers stacked up and you can compare their beaks really readily. Um, it often involves a sympatric species, meaning they're living right there together, like on the Galapagos Islands or in Hawaii, right? And you have a removal of a competitor or predator, or you have a change in the environment and then ecological release. So it's an opportunity for them to expand and it will decrease competition, right? They're doing that to have less competition with each other by eating other foods. Now, another example, and I put this in your notes, right, is when dinosaurs roam the earth, right? Um, large predators, 
um, when you have the collapse um, of dinosaurs, then all of a sudden now you have all these new ranges and habitats available. And that's when you had your, mam your mammalian explosion and all the new species of mammals um, evolving from there. And I gave you that in your notes as well. Okay, now one thing to look out for is convergent evolution. So it doesn't mean that they are related, but they're dealing with their environment in the same way. So it doesn't matter if you're a fish, a reptile, or a mammal, if you're trying to move through the move through water, this is a nice um, streamlined body to have and then fins to help direct your movement. So you're not closely related, but you evolve similar traits because you're dealing with your environment within the same way. So on your definition, Definition for convergent evolution defined occurs when biological traits evolves to unrelated species um, as a result of exposure to similar environments. And I said, think analogous structures, right? Because we know um, a fish and a mammal, right? We know the fin of a fish is quite different than the fin of a mammal. A mammal has a humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Remember, we talked about homologous structures, but you don't see that same anatomy in a fish. But these are analogous in that it helps them move through the water about function. Analogous structures have similar functions. Let me give you another reminder on that. A bird, a bat, and a bee. What do they all do? They fly, right? But the bee structure of their wing isn't the same as the bird and the bat. And this is a result of convergent evolution. We're converging on a good way to solve this problem of living in our environment. Okay. Um, let me give you some other examples of that. Okay, so here we can see the placental versus uh, the marsupial uh, mammals, um, comparing um, a mouse to a placental mouse. You can see that, uh, sorry, placental mouse to a marsupial mouse. You can see they look very, very similar. They're exploiting their niche in the same way. Here, flying squirrels or flying phalanger, um, they're exploiting their environments in the same way, a result of convergent evolution because they have similar habitats. Okay, you can also see this in um, cichlids um, and African lake fish. You can look at how they parallel through all the different species, how many similar species they have, though they don't have that opportunity, these lakes are miles apart, to go from one lake to another lake. Okay, and then a classic example of that is the Anolis lizard. And so this is two things are going on here. Uh, one is adaptive radiation and one is convergent evolution. So first, adaptive radiation, you know what that means, because spreading out just like the finches trying to fill every gap there in the niche. So look at all these different the different um, lizards. You've got this crown giant. He's on the crown of the tree, really large. You've got ones that are on twigs, ones that are on the trunk, one that goes from the trunk to the ground, one on grass and bush, right? So that is the adaptive radiation part. The convergent evolution part is how many different islands the same thing has happened on, right? And so th they've solved the problem in the same way. Their body types, length of their tail, even their coloring. So if we look right here, move myself out of the way, okay? The, the different types of anole lizards have evolved adaptations that enable them to be successful in different ecological niches in different parts of the trees, grass, and bushes. So here is the ecomorph. The ecomorph is the morphology in this particular environment. We have various morphologies here. And then, so you have the crown giant. And look, the crown giant, that structure where they have this body length, limb length, um, tail length coloring, you can find it on all four of these particular islands, okay? But their ancestor is way back before having any of these traits, just, you know, it, it, and so these they they went down the same pathways on each of these islands. They are not closely related. They have identified that they are not. Um, and then you can see the same thing with the trunk crown and the twig. You can see is found on all four. Um, so that is a really good example of both adaptive radiation and convergent evolution. All right, now oh, and we'll watch this video in class. Not right here. It's going to want to play, but I, there we go. All right. 
Next, let's talk about some principles of macroevolution. And part of this is going to be a review, timing, genes, and opportunities. So this is 17.3 in your notes. So patterns of evolution. The first one is we, we've talked about the how, the allopatric and the sympatric, but now the speed at which it occurs. So there's phyletic gradualism, which is exactly what it sounds like. Slow, gradual um, pathway, lots of intermediates that you can see, let's say, in the fossil record. Um, whereas punctuated equilibrium is fairly rapid and you don't have a lot of intermediates to see in the fossil record mind you punctuated equilibrium um the rapid one means that you would see changes over like a million years that's rapid in when we talk about um evolution so on your um, introduction models of evolution gradualistic model um, speciation occurs after populations become isolated, right? Maybe some sort of geographical barrier. And then each group continuing slowly on its evolutionary path, many transitional links and fossils, okay? Punctuated equilibrium, species appear quite suddenly, followed by um, a period of stasis where you don't see a lot of change. And it could be anywhere in between these, right? These are your two extremes. Could be both depending on how quickly the um, environment changes, right? And how fast they can respond to that. And then again, I have a video on that, but we will watch that in class. Sorry. All right. And then your next topic in, and this should be a review, right? Developmental genes and macro evolution. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is pretty much, you know, all of this, right? But Again, it's differences in timing and expression of those genes, where whether or not you lose your hind limbs or not and have fewer, um, whether or not your phalanges, like for us, right, this is how long our phalanges are, but for a bat, it spans their whole wing. So their timing is much longer in their phalange development. That gene is turned on for longer than it is for us, which causes this variation. So all organisms share the same control switches for development, differences in timing and expression, differences in timing and expression. Okay. Now, let me give you some more. And this would also fall underneath the evidence of evolution is that animals um, bilateral animals all contain this Pax C gene, or sorry, Pax six gene, and what this does is it goes for eye development, whatever type of eye you might have, right? And so it controls the position of the eyes on the body plan, um, and not only is it important for the eye, but also for brain, nervous system development, and even your nose. Because remember, your brain, right, your occipital lobe, in our case, has to connect to our eye, yes? And so you find this Pax6 Pax gene in all bilateral animals, okay? And I think I give you everything for that. Yeah, you just need to add in all, okay? Another one. Okay, is the TBX5 gene, which codes for a protein, which is a transcription factor. And it's expressed in the limb buds of both birds and in humans. So in chick wings and in humans, that same gene is expressed for the development of limbs. And for that one, you got it all. Okay, and then let's not forget about our Hox genes, right? Our homeobox genes that control for the subdivision of embryos, those regions. Um, and you can see those genes. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a mouse or a fruit fly um, or a person, you can see those same genes repeating themselves. So um, you just want to add in Hox homeotic genes control segmentation in vertebrates invertebrates not invertebrates okay invertebrates and all animals okay and then here is another one okay the pit x1 so when you look at this this is your gene right here so it's going in this direction that's this little arrow but there are four promoters surrounding this particular gene and what has happened is that you've had a mutation in this one promoter in this hind limb so now it, it's inactivated it it's no longer effective and as a result um, these freshwater sticklebacks 
do not have those long spines that these marine sticklebacks have. Okay. And now as it is having long spines, if you're swimming on the surface of the water is great, but if you're in lower water, not so good. So by having that mutation, it makes them more adaptive to those lower water um, swimming. So there's key parts on this. There is a link to human evolution, but what I want to say in number six on your notes um, is that we have, let's go over the notes on that, that humans have 23,000 genes approximately, but investigators now, instead of looking for novel genes, they are looking for new functions for old genes. Now look for new functions for old genes instead of new genes, right? Because this same gene got you two different characteristics just because of a mutation in the promoter. So all genes have chance mutation that can cause variations and natural selection acts on variations that are already present. So when this mutation occurred, you might think, oh great, now I cannot function anymore, but it turns out you can swim in those lower waters. All right, now last thing. Okay, so what is evolution and what isn't evolution? I see this diagram all the time to represent evolution. If you Google evolution, you will see this diagram. This is not evolution. This is going back to scala nature, right? We're going all the way back to Lamarck here. So this suggests prog uh, excuse me, progress, not adaptation. Okay, and it's also assuming that this is what the chimp always wanted to be was a human. Like it's trying to be goal oriented, to be upright man. So that that is not true at all. This is what evolution looks like: branching, branching. If you're adaptive, you stay. If not, you're going extinct. In fact, ninety nine percent of all life that's ever walked on this planet is already extinct right and so chimps are not portrayed as our ancestors but we could have common ancestors to the chimp right lots of branching so you want to remember that um, evolution is not goal oriented evolution is not goal oriented it is opportunistic okay and that's the word i would highlight it is opportunistic and you could see it in the evolution of the horse as their environment changed then what adaptations were best that changed as well, right? So there were three trends in the horse, increase in overall size, toe reduction, and change in tooth size and shape, which followed the change in the environment. All right, my friends, that is it for chapter 17 for us. And if you're one of my students, I'll see you in class.